Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Jonathan Rowley. My background is in architecture. Let's roll the titles. Um, and I run a 3D printing studio based in London. We run industrial level 3D printing technology. What's been so interesting for me about attending this conference so far is seeing and understanding the ways in which creative people are bringing ideas to technology and challenging technology. And that is what... Is it coming? And, and that, that, that is what we try to help people to do. We are here to talk to people about their ideas and guide them through whether or not 3D printing has got any, any relevance to what they're doing, whether it's semi-relevant or it's entirely relevant. And it's about helping, it's about communicating um, to help you achieve something purposeful. It would be really nice if this... <laughs> because, because I know if I've got things to show you. If this doesn't happen, I may have to revert to reality. Some of you may have seen in the display of objects that were through in the other room yesterday, some of these fabrics were produced by us. Now yesterday, obviously because they were in a collection, you were only able to pick these up with latex gloves on. I'm quite happy for you to handle these with your bare fingers, get them grubby, feel them, touch them, pull them, feel what it's like because the real problem with uh, a lot of people's experience with 3D printing is that they can't engage with it. If they go to an exhibition, it's under glass. That is totally useless. It's, it's, it's material. Just because it's created digitally, the output is material, and you need to understand that material. The interesting thing, oh, here we are, excellent. So yeah, we're talking transcending 3D printing. Now I have to really whip through these. Um, now, I won't dwell on this at all. Um, if anybody knows me, uh, I can be very negative, not negative, but critical about 3D printing because an awful lot of what you are presented with as awesome is just rubbish. And I won't, I won't dwell on it um, because it's, it's an insult, especially that last one as an architect, to talk about 3D printed buildings. It's, it's a joke. The other thing to look out for is very often things that you're shown as 3D printed that has never been realized. That is a very sophisticated CAD rendering. Somebody has drawn that and has therefore and then presented that as a 3D printed shoe. That thing has never been made. It's only been rendered. So whenever you're looking at these things, you've always got to be critical. You know, how much of it is 3D printed? Has it been 3D printed at all? Um, and is it any good? Now, most of this is not worth wasting my precious time with. Now, that's shouting 3D printing. The best 3D printing is the stuff that's silent, that it speaks for itself. This is an exquisite shoulder piece made up of 110 individual, individually 3D printed feathers, fully articulated, attached to a, an armature. That is an exquisite mirror finish gold football. The, the, the real craft in all of this is in the CAD, the art is in the CAD file. The machine just makes whatever you throw at it. That isn't 3D printed, that is a 3D print that has been rubbed back and then copper plated and gold plated to achieve a spectacular finish. And it transcends 3D printing, it's just a glorious object. And those flashy little things are very simple, they are just CT scans of pine cones reduced in scale, hollowed out with a tapered cylinder so that they'll accept an LED light to stick on your Christmas tree. Very simple stuff, but it trans... I didn't have to tell you that they're sweet because they're 3D printed, they're just sweet. Now, I just want to run through a few examples of projects that we've helped people with to achieve what they want through the use of 3D printing. Oscar Lehmeter is a very clever gentleman who obtained the, the digital data of the surface of the moon from NASA, and he wanted to produce a perfectly accurate lunar globe. And, you know, as a lot of people would assume, that 3D printing is going to allow him to manufacture these globes. Now, first of all, he went through a whole load of technologies 
to try and establish one that gave him the resolution that was good enough because 3D prints are stripey and you don't want stripes across the moon. So he came to us using nylon SLS. We did some little test slices to do prototypes. You don't have to do an entire moon. You can do little cheap sections. That was the material he wanted. Great, Jonathan. How much is the full moon going to cost me? Well, that diameter is about that. That's about 700 pounds worth of 3D print, which makes his whole project economically very expensive. And I said to him, you, you, know, you don't have to 3D print it. You can print a master, and then you can create a mold and produce it in the material that you want much more quickly, much more affordably. And he took that on board, and this young man went away and apprenticed himself in a roto molding company for a year, learned how to do it, and these things via Kickstarter are now available for you to buy. That is not 3D printed, but 3D printing has enabled that to produce an incredibly high quality object. You know, this is a, is a demonstration of the craft involved in selecting the correct software. You know, to model the head of a lion, you're not using SolidWorks. Or you could do, but you would spend t two months of your life fighting the technology. It's about selecting sculpting technology like Anne-Marie's to do the lion's head. You only model half the lion's head and you mirror it. To produce the Gucci logos and the Chanel logos, you can produce those in Photoshop. And it's about producing your elements in the correct software and bringing them together to create a beautiful digital file. Very, very simple. A company called Bompus and Par, who do a lots of big events surrounding jelly. And they first came to us and said, can you print jelly molds? And we said, well, you know, most of our materials are not food compatible. Probably not. How, how are you making them now? Well, we're, we're you know, using vacuum forming. OK, well, you know, let's, let's produce your forms for you to then vacuum form in food compatible material. Um, and, and they're running with this. You know, that you 3D print once and take it into a process that allows you to bang things off. Um, crafting CAD jewellery. A lot of jewellers are very resistant to the use of CAD and 3D printing in the production of jewellery. And I can understand that because there are a lot of people who are now calling themselves jewellers who've been liberated by CAD and 3D printing and are selling 3D printed jewellery. Um, and they are just throwing shapes at casters and getting pretty average results, if any results at all. So that, sorry, this is an example of producing the ring that you want, then understanding the casting process, that casting that all in one piece is very ambitious and probably isn't going to work. It's about carving, and with that understanding, carving it up into two parts and then hollowing it out so you're reducing the amount of metal, less challenging for the casting, and then designing a little plate that fits in together. And it's not just a case of chopping that in half, it's about cutting along the scales. And that's fairly sophisticated, but then if you get more, even more sophisticated, you can do an undercut so it overlaps, giving you a surface to weld against. And so when that is translated into metal, it transcends 3D printing. It's just a beautiful object because there's been craft applied to the digital process. This is understanding the material properties of some 3D printing. This is nylon SLS again, which you know, in my view is the Rolls Royce of 3D print materials because it has material properties. Most 3D printed plastics are brittle um, and are just three-dimensional photocopiers. They just make shapes. You give it a shape, it gives you a shape back. If you understand the material properties of this, you can design your shapes to perform. Now, some, uh, in my view, quite silly people call this kind of object a 4D print, where the 3D print is that shape, and then it transforms into a fourth dimension. That's gibberish. This is just designing. This is understanding a material, designing with it, and making it perform. It's not four-dimensional printing. It's just designing. And you can design with this. And the whole genesis of this is that you know, 3D printing that as a single box is extremely expensive because you're printing fresh air. This, 
this is, was redesigned effectively as a paper model, and I've got, an ex I've got it here for you to look at. You can print it flat and then design it to, to create the space that you want. So instead of £225 for a 3D printed bird box, which is not awesome, you've got two components which cost you 15 quid that form the part. Um, very like Oscar's uh, moon, this is a lady called Beth Lewis Williams who wanted to 3D print porcelain. And as I often have to say, I'm very sorry, madam, but we can't print in that material. And certainly not at the quality that you're after. So I get her to tell me about porcelain production, which she understands. And she wanted to produce these lithophanes, whereby she would take a photograph, produce a bump map, give a depth to that, to that photograph, wrap it around a globe, and then she wanted to, tr to translate that into porcelain. So what we did was we encouraged her to print a master, which she then built a slip mould around, and then was able to produce these amazing things. None of that is 3D printed, but without 3D printing, it's not happening. And so these are quiet applications of this technology to produce stunning results. No one's impressing you with awesome technology that you all have in your home is going to change everything. It's just sensible, skilled applications of the technology to get you what you want. Um, please come and handle. Thank you very much.